Guten Abend. Dürfte ich Ihre Aufmerksamkeit haben? Hallo. Busy times. Interesting times. Ähm, sehr geehrte Frau Bürgermeisterin Haasch, sehr geehrte Stadträte und Rätinnen, dear members, dear friends, dear Fiona, ähm, herzlich willkommen zu unserem heutigen Top Talk mit Dr. Fiona Hill. There she is. Ja. Titled Cold Times Question Mark. The United States, Russia and China. And talk we will. Mein Name ist Katharina Luther und ich bin die Direktorin dieses Binationalen Instituts, des Deutsch-Amerikanischen Instituts hier in Tübingen. Und ich freue mich so sehr, Sie heute Abend hier zu diesem sehr besonderen Zeitenwende-Gespräch im Haus zu haben. Schön, dass Sie hier sind und Ihre Zeit mit uns verbringen. Um, welcome. Eine kleine Anmerkung in eigener Sache, wenn Sie dieses Gespräch heute Abend anspricht und Sie unsere transatlantische Kultur- und Wissensaustauscharbeit nachhaltig und engagiert unterstützen wollen, dann würde ich mich freuen, wenn Sie Mitglied in unserem Trägerverein werden. Wir können diese Arbeit hier heute Abend nicht ohne unsere Mitglieder machen, auch nicht unsere, ohne unsere Kooperationspartner. Ähm, Im Endeffekt gilt dann doch immer das gute alte DRI-Motto Better Together. Und weil man tatsächlich nichts im Leben allein macht oder wahrscheinlich auch allein machen sollte, möchte ich an dieser Stelle ganz herzlich unseren Kooperationspartnern danken. Das ist einmal die Stadt Tübingen. Ohne die Stadt Tübingen und hier besonders die Fachabteilung für Kunst, Kultur und internationale Beziehungen wäre dieser ganze Abend überhaupt nicht möglich. Vielen, vielen Dank. Ja. Dann möchte ich noch dem Institut für Politikwissenschaften der Universität Tübingen danken und dem Weltethos-Institut danke. Und Sie haben es schon gehört, dreimal bei meinen Danksagungen fiel der Name Tübingen, Tübingen, Tübingen. Ähm, und die Verwurzelung in Tübingen von uns allen, die der Schüler Austauschaufenthalt von Fiona Hill in Tübingen vor ein paar Jahren. <lacht> und Tübingen selbst und die Stadt und alles, was diese Stadt irgendwie lebendig macht und greifbar macht, ist heute Abend ein wichtiger Kumulationspunkt. Und deswegen möchte ich Frau Dr. Daniela Haasch auf die Bühne bitten, unsere Bürgermeisterin für Soziales, Ordnung und Kultur, um noch zu uns zu sprechen. Daniela, you've got the floor. Ja. Vielen Dank. Und mir ist natürlich klar, dass das jetzt ungefähr so ist, wie bei den Filmtagen vor Beginn des Films zu sprechen. Alle denken, noch ein Grußwort dabei geht es ja eigentlich um, um etwas ganz anderes. Und daher möchte ich es auch dabei belassen, Sie im Namen der Stadt Tübingen hier zu begrüßen. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass die Veranstaltung jetzt möglich ist. Ähm, Covid hat die letzten Jahre so einiges verschoben und so hat Covid auch ähm, im Herbst die Veranstaltung in, ins Frühjahr verschoben. Allerdings ist Tübingen im Frühling auch deutlich, deutlich schöner oder im Sommer. Von daher können Sie der Verspätung vielleicht auch etwas, etwas abgewinnen. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass Fiona Hill heute, heute hier ist und nicht nur, um über all diese spannenden Themen zu sprechen, sondern weil es uns auch so sehr motiviert, an den Städtepartnerschaften festzuhalten. Fiona Hill kam 1981 aus unserer Partnerstadt Durham hierher als Schülerin und lernte so Deutschland und Tübingen kennen, was sie bis heute mit unserer Stadt verbindet und mit der ehemaligen Gastfamilie Schmidt. Und manchmal fragen wir uns, wie viel Aufwand sollen wir betreiben für diese Austausche? Und wenn wir dann erleben, wie viel... Ähm, Verbindungen entstanden sind, wie viel Liebesbeziehungen entstanden sind, aber auch wie viel gegenseitiges Verständnis dadurch erwachsen kann und wie viel Promis es uns Jahre später in, in unsere Stadt bringt, dann ist es das wert, auch wenn jede und jeder von uns heute mal an einen, an einen Austausch denkt und die 
diese uns alle geprägt hat. Und deswegen bedanke ich mich auch sehr beim Kulturamt dafür, gerade während dieser schwierigen Pandemiezeiten auch ähm, all unsere Städtepartnerschaften, ähm, mit Ausnahme einer, um die es vielleicht nachher auch gehen wird, ähm, zu pflegen und voranzutreiben, weil genau diese Verbindung zwischen Kulturen uns auch voneinander lernen lässt, das Herz auch, auch öffnet, ein Verständnis erwachsen lässt und so wichtig für, für unseren Austausch ist. Ich hatte heute Morgen eine Klasse aus, aus Norwegen da, nicht unsere, unsere Partnerstadt, aber es war trotzdem spannend, welche Fragen die jungen Leute umgetrieben haben und was sie auch, wie sie mich abgefragt haben, was ich eigentlich über Norwegen weiß. Frau Weizsäcker war zum Glück kürzlich da und hat mir viel erzählt, konnte ich dann alles anbringen und beweisen, dass ich einigermaßen gut zuhöre. Und ich hoffe, dass noch viele junge Menschen durch unsere Städtepartnerschaften die Gelegenheit erleben, ähm, andere Städte, andere Familien, andere Schulsysteme kennenzulernen. Und nicht immer werden Menschen wie Sie dann 40 Jahre später wiederkommen und so spannende Beiträge leisten können, auf die ich mich jetzt sehr, sehr freue. Herzlichen Dank und vielen Dank, dass wir diese Veranstaltung heute zusammen am BAI machen dürfen. Fiona Hill, thank you so much no, for joining please. us. And also, congratulations on your most recent appointment as Chancellor of the University of Durham, talking about Durham, right? Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, thank Give you. Give it up. <laughs> so, people in Tübingen know you. <laughs> This, and um, people in Tübingen presumably know you mainly for two things, right? First of all, for your, of course, for your professional achievements as presidential advisor and as uh, a security expert for Europe and for Russia. But also, and this became clear over and over again just now, they know you for your personal story and your personal entanglement with Tübingen. A coal miner's daughter from the northeast of England who went abroad to Tübingen on a regional, and I think that's important, a region, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> on a regional school exchange, and then, you know, ended up among many other places at the White House, and then turned that story into a fantastic book, namely, There's Nothing for You Here. Um, and if you are still looking for a summer read, this might just be it. Right? <laughs> um, we also have it at the library and also at our online library. Um, and before we are gonna um, join in into our conversation and before we then turn to you with a Q&A, because I'm quite aware that you want to ask Fiona all the questions, um, I want to lean into both sides of the story, right? So Fiona was born in Bishop Oakland, a former coal town in County Durham, and studied history in Russia at St. Andrews in Scotland. A graduate scholarship then took her to Harvard in 1989, so just after the Cold War ended. Actually, just before it ended. <laughs> just I before it ended, in yeah. September, and by October, November, it had gone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, where she earned a PhD in Russian history. And in There's Nothing for You Here, she writes about her personal journey from the northeast of England to the US. And I quote, through hard work, luck, and government support, I managed to go farther than my dad could have ever imagined. Education was my route out of poverty and the door to opportunity. And speaking of opportunity and the art of seizing and embracing opportunity, right, that's important as well. Fiona later became a senior intelligence analyst serving under President Bush and President Obama. After a short period at the Brookings Institute in DC, which is a public policy NGO, Fiona became the deputy assistant and senior director for European and Russian affairs to President Donald Trump in 2017. And then famously, Fiona Hill testified yeah, against Donald Trump in his first impeachment hearings, giving evidence on the realities of Russian interference in the 2016 elections. 
Uh, Fiona, you're currently a Bosch Fellow in Berlin, and um, yep. <clears throat> you are doing really interesting research on Eastern Germany, um, I read, and also on the impacts of post-industrialization and populism. Um, and Fiona, there's also a Fiona Hill to go in book form, right? Um, Fiona Hill wrote two books. Um, the highly acclaimed Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, which is apparently the, the book on Putin. And then there is nothing for you here, which entangles personal storytelling with history and social analysis. And today she's here, yeah, um, to talk with us about cold times question mark, the United States, Russia and China, which naturally brings me to my first question, right? right? <laughs> cold times, um, which seems to play with a free enrichment that triggers the idea of the cold times, cold war, right, um, between the United States, Russia, and the US. Um, but you, it does say cold times. So I wonder if you can elaborate on the idea of our contemporariness being cold and what that then does to this relationship. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how thrilled I am to be here in Tubing. And I have been waiting for that moment to just say, you know, I'm, when I first came here as um, uh, a teenager, I thought yeah. I'd died and gone to heaven when I arrived in Tübingen. Huh. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not joking about that. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. I came, the first day we arrived was a sunny day like this. Um, you know, we were coming from um, a Britain at that point in the north of England that was going through a really wrenching transformation of deindustrialization, mass unemployment in my hometown. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, where is this? <laughs> Thank you, County Durham and Tübingen for uh, and Baden-Württemberg and uh, the universities and all of the other you know, cultural groups were getting uh, together. And I also just wanted to say that it was my experience here as an exchange student, as uh, the deputy mayor was suggesting, that set me off on this path because you know, I hadn't really lived um, abroad for any uh, length of time. My host uh, family, the Schmitz, um, who were still here and I hope to see them um, on Friday, couldn't have been more welcoming. And they also had their own fascinating stories. And it was the first time that I'd spent uh, um, you know, a long period with another family who were telling me their family stories. And it really opened up my eyes because they had been children in Frankfurt during the firebombing of Frankfurt and had to flee the town. And I knew nothing about what the British had actually done or the Americans in terms of you know, the bombing of German cities, because that wasn't really what we were taught in, um, in history classes. And so that opened up a whole new avenue of inquiry for me. I started to read about it. I asked lots of questions. And they also took me on a huge tour around, I mean, they're just a wonderful um, host family around Baden-Württemberg and off into all the neighboring countries. And I really got a kind of a sense then about what Europe was about. Uh, Britain had not been that long in the European Union. Tragically now, 50 years later, Britain's out of the European Union. Uh, but it really gave me a kind of a sense of what Europe meant as well. And what was happening here in terms of, um, uh, you know, Germany itself still being in a process of uh, transformation. So I would actually want to say here, please keep up exchanges. Uh, please expand them as much as you can. I mean, these play an important role in the formation of, of people. And I'm eternally grateful um, for that. Now, cold times. I think <laughs> if we were thinking about this again, because we came up with that idea of a title some time ago, we'd probably call it very hot times. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, I think um, one of the very sad things, I was speaking to a group of students um, earlier, and many of them um, uh, here today, is I feel that in a very unfortunate way, kind of come full circle. Because when I came here in tubing in, in the um, early 1980s, it was the, at the height of the Cold War. Um, it was a Euro missile crisis that had started in 1977 and went through to 1987. And now here we are again talking about nuclear Armageddon, you know, the risk of uh, a tactical or an intermediate uh, nuclear weapon being um, used in, in Europe. We have a hot war, a vicious war, um, a, a brutal war, the largest military action in Europe since World War II, the largest refugee crisis. All the things that we said that we were never going to do again are happening again. And, you know, how on earth did we get there? And then we have China in the title as well. And of course, we have a great deal of concern that we're heading in exactly the same direction, at least certainly from the United States perspective, because when I left the US um, in March, uh, the beginning of March, uh, to start my position at the Bosch um, Stiftung, 
you know, we'd had the balloon incident um, in the United States with the, um, I mean, that was bizarre, but also very worrying because my favorite song back in the 1980s, maybe it was some other, everybody else's as well, was <laughs> Neun und Nonsig Luftballoon, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I kept changing the words slightly, one big white balloon floating in the summer sky. I thought, oh my God, it's the same thing. You know, how balloons, you know, flying around could trigger off an alert and a kind of a nuclear alert and two countries could come, you know, on the verge of a confrontation. And there was a sort of a sense of inevitability of war between the United States and China as I was leaving. Mm -hmm. Now, we've uh, just uh, or are about to have, I'm kind of losing the track of who's gone where, but we have Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, off to China to try to take the temperature down on some of the um, economic issues. Uh, we've had uh, Anthony Blinken, the um, uh, Secretary of State, going. There is a sort of a realization now that perhaps things are barreling you know, forward towards confrontation far too quickly. When I went to study in the United States in 1989, just before the Cold War ended, <laughs> uh, my first job, even as I was studying with, with Graham Allison, Professor Graham Allison at the Kennedy School of Government, who's very famous for writing about the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, his book uh, Essence of Decision is probably on many people's curriculum here. And of course, he was also working very actively on trying to resolve the nuclear tensions uh, with Russia after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. I worked with him on those um, issues, and he's just written a book called The Thucydides Trap, actually warning about the risks of barreling towards another confrontation uh, with China. So, um, you know, history doesn't repeat. Sometimes people say it rhymes. Certainly mm -hmm. patterns seem to repeat. Um, if we look, you know, back to 100 years ago, to the 1920s, you know, we can see many of the same issues that we're grappling with now. We're definitely in hot times, which are somewhat reminiscent of, you know, the period that I started out on this journey by coming to tubing in, in international affairs at the peak of, uh, of the Cold War. And, you know, for all the students who are sitting here, I mean, very sadly, they're going to be contending with many of the same things um, that, that we were in that time frame too. And we obviously didn't come up with great responses. Mm. So um, I don't say I think we're back to zero, but we're certainly, you know, dealing with a lot of you know, the, the problems we had before, I hope that this time we've learned our lessons mm -hmm. because we know, you know, many things that worked and didn't work um, uh, in earlier periods. And um, anyway, it's a, it's a very um, yeah. a, a tough challenge. And then we have climate change and obviously the after effects of the pandemic, which we really should be focusing on. But the international affairs keep dragging us back yeah. uh, into different patterns of discussion. Yeah. And one of the thinking of hot times and the different patterns of history and so on, one of the main topics that then is back on the agenda again is security, right? Exactly. And how we can think about new ways of security in Europe. Um, and you just mentioned some lessons that we can learn from these patterns. Can you um, clarify that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, in some respects, it looks like we've gone back to the past. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't so long ago that President Macron of France declared NATO brain dead. Mm. Uh, my colleagues at Brookings, uh, Mike Mc, uh, Michael O'Hanlon and others were writing books like Beyond NATO, rethinking, you know, European security. And as a result of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we seem to be all back to, you know, where we were in the 1980s with our focus being on NATO. I actually remember a pamphlet when I was a kid in school that was kind of distributed, I think, by the NATO public, you know, kind of affairs office or something with a couple of people lounging around on a grass, clearly students enjoying themselves. And it said brought to you by NATO. And I used to think, what does that mean? Uh, all the <laughs> students what, what lying on the grass having you know a beer or something because of NATO I didn't I never quite understood at the time you know what that what that meant but of course it was the whole idea that we had to secure Europe and that people could lounge around the glass the grass having a beer because they didn't have to worry about their security which wasn't entirely true because we had a you know a, a, um, a, a war scare yeah. with the Soviet Union in the 1980s at the same time so there was obviously a lot of contradictions you know going on here and you know I will say that you know when I was a younger person, teenager, I was protesting the stationing of nuclear weapons, the SS-20s and Pershing missiles in Europe. My mother's cousin was the kind of the leader of the uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament in, in our region. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations in my you know previous jobs where 
Uh, now Chancellor Schultz was talking about the time when he was there with his long hair protesting. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. You know, <laughs> what it might, like those people on the, with having the beer, you know, kind of on the grass. Uh, and Chancellor Merkel uh, previously also talked about how she was protesting in um, East Germany. And we all thought, oh, my God, you know, kind of we're on the, the precipice yeah. of a, uh, you know, a nuclear exchange. And I had a poster on my dorm wall. Uh, when I went to university um, that was called Gone with the Wind. You might have seen this poster. It's a very famous poster. And it had Ronald Reagan wearing his you know, cowboy outfit, holding Margaret Thatcher dressed like Scarlett O'Hara from <laughs> Gone with the Wind. And a big mushroom cloud behind it said he promised he'd take her to the ends of the world. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and and so that was the that was the whole atmosphere and it, it just you know it felt very threatening it was the reason i decided to study russian i thought i might become a translator for arms control mm -hmm. negotiations didn't quite work out as as i had thought but it was that you know kind of whole sense that um you know european security was on the press uh, the precipice that we had these opposing blocks and we needed to do something to overcome it mm -hmm. And, and now we seem to be right back there again, but I would actually argue that perhaps not, mm -hmm. because it's very interesting when you start to look at why the Finns and the Swedes have decided to join NATO. It mm. kind of turns a lot of things on their head. Now, the Swedes aren't in yet because of the standoff with Turkey, and that's a whole other you know, set of discussions. But the Finns are very articulate and very clear about why they decided to join NATO right now after decades of not wanting to join. Yes, they had the open door, but they never intended to join. And I've spent a lot of time in Finland and talking to Finns, including the Finnish uh, foreign minister and the president and many other people in the, the Finnish government. And they had several key answers. And I think this kind of tells you about, you know, what we need to be thinking about European security. So the Finns have not joined because they want NATO 1.0, the NATO of the 1980s. They're just recognizing that it's the only right now instrument and mechanism that is still functioning on European security, but that needs to move forward. We need to rethink. Before the invasion of Ukraine, the Finns were pushing for a Helsinki 2.0, so a revitalization of the organization of security and cooperation in Europe. And they'd been really pushing that very actively. So thinking in a much broader sense of how you have a more holistic approach uh, to security and also how you would engage with Russia in that context. Obviously, this has changed. But the reasons that, that the Finns changed their mind was, first of all, because of the nuclear weapons. The Finns never thought that the Russians were really serious uh, prior to the invasion of Ukraine about using nuclear weapons. At least it was hard to envisage it because we had that standoff, you know, mutual deterrence dating back to the Cold War, and everyone was a rational actor. Well, I think Vladimir Putin is still a rational actor, but he's also become a rogue actor. He's rational in his desire to manipulate everybody's fears about nuclear war in the same way as they were manipulated, you know, back in the 1980s. Uh, um, but, you know, then obviously we can talk about how different that was to now because he wants to, you know, basically get us to give up Ukraine in return for him not basically um, using a nuclear weapon, a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine or even, you know, kind of these discussions about intermediate nuclear weapons again. People I've worked with in the Russian context, like Dmitry Trenin and Sergei Karaganov, have recently been writing articles saying that they should nuke us. And that, you know, nuclear weapons are God's gift. They would never have said anything like this. They literally talked about God's gifts of nuclear weapons. I mean, it's rather crazy statements. And these are people who are very rational and would never have written about these kinds of things in previous circumstances. It's clear that it's an intimidation tactic. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a with a, an intent but the you know the Finns are basically saying look we're now dealing with a rogue state and a rogue actor in the soviet period you had the politburo you had state control you had checks and balances putin is an operative and he's he's definitely thinking about how he can use a nuclear weapon in some fashion either for intimidation we've also got the zaporizhia nuclear plant uh, that is also being held hostage he's become you know an all-purposes nuclear menace uh, with all of these threats. And, you know, we can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, that the um, uh, the Russian government said they were not going to invade Ukraine. And yet they amassed all the troops on the borders. They said, that's just, we're having an exercise. They pulled all the troops away from the Finnish border. So the Finns are saying, OK, well, if they come back, are they going to invade us? Because they've just said they're not going to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they did. And Putin is basically saying, that Ukraine isn't an independent state, it's part of the Russian Empire. Well, guess what? We also were part of the Russian Empire. In 1939, yeah. Stalin invaded us to take us back again, just like taking back the Baltic states. 
what are the what are the risks then that uh, you know uh, Russia decides to do something for Finland and get more of Karelia and you know move into the Finnish territory? We can't now rule that out, whereas before we did rule it out. And then there's you know the brutality of the war, all of the human rights abuses, and um, the Finns now have decided that well for the future of European security we have to be part of this mechanism, and we have to then you know start to think about how we uh, make Europe secure before we then, mm. you know, move on to the kind of next phase of a Helsinki 2.0 or how we would then start to rethink European security. And then there's just one thing I wanted to say about the Finns, and I, 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 I say sorry to the students because I already kind of said this before, that the Finns um, have always been really serious about their security. The Finns yeah. can call up 280,000 people into arms in a crisis. That's their reserve force and their permanent standing army. Not many other European countries can do that. And they're all fully armed and they all know exactly what role they have to play. And plus they've spent an awful lot of time of thinking about um, resilience of their society and their politics and their economics. The Finns, um, uh, yes, they had a kind of, most of their gas was coming from uh, Russia, but it was only 10% uh, and then less. They kept bringing it down of their whole fuel mix. They had lots of investments in Russia, lots of mixed marriages and, um, visas, the, the, the Finns gave more Schengen visas to Russians than anyone else. They kind of kept them close, they engaged with them, but they were always ready at the slightest hint of trouble, you know, to kind of basically jump into action. And the Finns are basically saying, you're going to have to think like us about European security. It's not just going to be about NATO. Uh, it's going to be about how you think about the resilience and adaptability of your, you know, countries and society as well. And the Finns still believe in the organization of security and cooperation in Europe, a larger you know, kind of a, a extent, and then if Sweden ends up in as well, this will be, you know, different ways of starting to think about mm. European security. So it's not back to the past, no. even if it looks as if we're going back to this. Yeah. So it's it's more, it's a regional approach, it's a cultural approach, it's a... It's a political, political, economic, yeah, and it's also working multi, together with yeah. others as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not just thinking of your security mm. or, you know, the Finns also not thinking about this as fortress Europe. It might be mm. worth having, you know, kind of a few Finns come and talk you know, <laughs> at some point to you, because it's very interesting in talking to them about how they're thinking about this. And they do want to engage with Russia again over, you know, the longer time. But they're being very serious about the implications of this war and what it means, and also making it very clear that they don't see what's happening to Ukraine as any different from something that could happen to them, because, you know, Ukraine was also you know, um, uh, initially an independent country at the collapse of uh, the the Russian empires, many did very briefly. Mm. Uh, and Finland managed to, you know, pull away. But 1939, Stalin tried to bring it right back again. I am thinking of a comment that the former US, US president, Donald Trump, made a couple of months ago, right, that went along the lines of him saying that if he were still president, the Russian invasion would end in 24 hours. Well, yeah, because he would have handed over Ukraine. Yeah. Or would have tried to, but I mean, it's not his to hand over. Mm -hmm. And the Ukrainians would have still fought. So it's actually kind of a silly statement. Yeah. I mean, really what it is about Trump, and I mean, you may all wonder how on earth did I end up, you know, kind of in that administration. It's a long story <laughs> and a bit of a strange one. But... Um, I mean, his view was that he was so amazing as an individual that he could sit down with anybody and resolve anything in about five minutes. So this is something he said about absolutely everything mm. because he believes in his own charisma and his own abilities. I mean, I think he you know, has a, there's a, there's a it's like Lauren During syndrome you know, where people kind of believe that they can actually do absolutely anything and they actually can't. It's become a feature of the Internet age as well. You know, you, you look online, you see somebody flying a plane. Oh, I can do that. And you actually can't. Or, you know, you want to say, please don't try this at home when people do, you know, crazy stunts. But everybody in you know, the kids in particular think that they can. Well, Trump kind of thinks he can do pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. And it was it was also, you know, very troubling. I mean, if we go back to, I'm talking about the Finns again, the debacle in Helsinki. Actually, what Trump thought that he was doing then at Helsinki was sitting down with Putin and doing another Gorbachev-Reagan mm -hmm. uh, or uh, Gorbachev later with George H.W. Bush. And he thought that he could you know, get rid of nuclear weapons just having a chat to Putin. Now, of course, the whole meeting went off <laughs> in a different uh, tangent entirely. But, you know, so it's on the one hand, his belief in his own great, personal um, skills and abilities to engage with people and persuade them of things. But the second thing was also because he had no interest really in Ukraine. 
And we saw that. I mean, what, what was that first impeachment was about him asking Zelensky, who was under all kinds of pressure at that time uh, from the Russians, to do him a personal favour. Mm -hmm. And he would always say, I don't like Ukraine. The Ukrainians didn't, didn't like me. They, you know, they interfered in the election. He didn't want to believe that Putin and the Russians had interfered. And he was actually you know, very susceptible to thinking that Ukraine um, had interfered and that he was being told that by Rudy Giuliani and other people as well. Uh, and you know, so he had a completely skewed view. And plus, um, he also believed that if you spoke Russian, you were a Russian, which is also kind of very much the view of um, Putin. And he'd absorbed you know, the idea that because um, this was part of the Russian Empire, forgetting, of course, that the United States was once part of the British Empire, and that just because you speak English doesn't make you English. But I, I mean, he hadn't really thought all that all the way through that if you were once part of the Russian Empire, then you belong to Russia, which, again, is why you get back to the Finns and the Poles and the Bolts and everybody, you know, feeling very nervous about that. So, I mean, he just has a very skewed view uh, about, um, you know, what it actually takes to resolve an issue. Mm -hmm. I want us to look back to China again for yeah. just one second. Um, what's China's role in all of this? Well, this is also extremely interesting mm -hmm. because I do think actually China, you know, could play a role in helping, you know, to find a resolution to this in a mm -hmm. diplomatic effort. Um, I mean, China might be, you know, one of the countries in President Xi that could actually push Putin, you know, towards a negotiating table at some point and help mm -hmm. to provide a frame. But there's a lot of complexity there. Um, I think, you know, one of uh, the uh, problems is the real deterioration in the U.S.-Chinese relationship. Because a lot of other places in the rest of the world actually think that this war in Ukraine is a proxy war, not between Russia and the United States, as Putin has said, but between China and the United States. Because, you know, there has been so much discussion in the US about, well, China's watching this conflict because of the parallels with Taiwan. And of course, that's actually got a lot of attention. That was intended in the US discourse to try to explain why it was so important to, uh, you know, support Ukraine because of the precedent it would set if Ukraine's independence and sovereignty and territorial integrity was stripped away by Russia, the former imperial power, you know, trying to regain control of it. China's watching. Well, then, that's the, then China itself, its rhetoric was picked up, you know, so much that the Chinese uh, government, and I think, and Xi and others start to think, well, hang on, is this a dry run for, you know, a conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan and the South China Seas, etc.? And that's become something that other uh, players globally have started to think as well. At Brookings, we've had a series of Zoom exchanges with think tanks um, from around the world uh, on these uh, topics. And uh, with our Brazilian counterparts, they actually said, we think this is the first proxy war uh, uh, in the conflict between China and the United States, because you've talked about it all so much. And we want to know what the Chinese think. Mm. So that puts us in a whole different dimension, because that obviously was not the intention at all. And it makes it, therefore, extremely difficult to resolve the conflict because most people look at the war in Ukraine through the prism of how they think about the United States. Mm -hmm. And if you think, well, the United States invaded Iraq or the United States did this and that and Russia's only doing what the United States did, then there's a kind of quite negative feeling about Ukraine. Instead of actually thinking that, you know, Ukraine, like Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, etc., etc., was part of the Soviet Union. They're all successor states of the Soviet Union, not just Russia. And why should Ukraine be invaded by Russia? Why should Russia have claims on Ukrainian territory, you know, any different than Britain having claims on parts of its empire, for example? Mm. Uh, you know, what if um, England reinvaded Ireland and took Ireland back? This is exactly the same situation. Donbass is no different really from Belfast and Ulster, mm. you know, in many respects. Why should England, you know, have Ireland back? And Ireland was a colony and part of England and, and uh, the, what became the United Kingdom for a hell of a lot longer than Ukrainian territory was part of the Russian Empire. Just mm. putting this in perspective here. You know, then, you know, you, you start thinking about this very differently. But, uh, you know, China is also looking at this conflict again through its prism of its deteriorated your relationship with the United States and doesn't want to do the U.S. a favor. So I think it's you know, also important for European countries with much better relationships uh, with China, like Germany and um, many others, to I mean, basically make the point this is really about European security and about you know, how not to turn the clock back on history. Because Putin's claims to Ukraine, let's think about it again. Everybody, and Trump would say, well, Crimea has always been part of Russia. No, 
uh, Ukraine, Crimea was once part of the Ottoman Empire. It was on maps as Petit Tartari. Uh, the indigenous people of Crimea are Crimean Tatars, Turkic speaking. Uh, obviously, you know, kind of a complex history of Crimea. Um, Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire fought against the Russians in the Crimean War. That gave Britain, you know, all kinds of strange things, from the Balaclava to Florence Nightingale, the National Health Service. You know, it's got a long and contentious um, history here. And just because Catherine the Great annexed it in 1783 doesn't make it, you know, kind of uh, Russian territory since time immemorial. What did Germany look like in 1783? You know, the United States was only barely um, uh, a new state after being a British uh, colony. And then, you know, Putin will go back and then, well, in Crimea in 988, uh, Grand Prince Vladimir, he's no longer Grand Prince Vladimir of Kiev, but the Holy Prince Vladimir took on Christianity. Well, 988 was before the Norman conquest of England. Um, and the Carolingians, you know, in uh, in Germany, I mean, Germany didn't look anything, you know, like it does today. Most countries were not on the map in 988. So, I mean, that's the problem that we face here in Europe, you know, thinking back to antiquity. Mm -hmm. I mean, my part of um, uh, Britain and Durham, we were under the Roman Empire. We had the Romans here as well. I mean, should we be rolled from Rome? Maybe we should go and ask, you know, Maloney and Prime Minister Maloney if he'll take us all back again. <laughs> you know, and then after that, we had the Danes. And actually, you've probably read recently that Orkney does want to go back uh, to the Danes and Norwegians. So that's interesting. The Orkney Islands have had it with Britain and they would like the Norwegians or the Danes to take them back and they're making an application. So, you know, maybe actually North of England should go back to the Danes. I mean, it might be much nicer you know, kind of than where things are now. We were under Dane law for hundreds of years. Mm. So, I mean, what's this? Yeah, I mean, th this is kind of, uh, this is the, the discussions that we ought to be or could be having, right? Mm. So this is actually the conundrum that was posed by the war in Ukraine. This is a war about history. Mm. You know, it's a kind of war about um, all kinds of uh, different things. And if we bring China back into the equation again, Russia sits on a lot of Chinese territory that it took by annexation at the same time as other European imperial powers took Chinese territory. Between 1858 and 1861, the whole of the Russian Far East was taken under various uh, treaties uh, from China at a period of great weakness. So somewhere down the line, what would stop China from saying, excuse me, you know, we have a, a claim on this territory. Russia has been in possession of that for far less time than the time that it's positing, you know, about uh, Crimea, for example. Mm. But what I would like to see on a, you know, kind of a, another note is that we have an international frame for a diplomatic effort to try to resolve this war. And we have China and other countries taking part in this as well, because the precedents for this are pretty negative. There's the nuclear security, there's nuclear weapons issues, there's food security. There's all the uh, issues related to climate change and pan future pandemics that we can't address. This is a disaster, this war. On every, on every different front. Just like many other wars and, and conflicts are, we need to find a way of resolving this. And I do think that China could play a role in this. Next to China, could something like rethinking the role of the UN be another path? I do think so. And actually, um, although we obviously do need a lot of UN reform, mm -hmm. There's still, um, you know, in the rest of the world, despite a lot of criticism about the UN, the main criticism is about the UN Security Council and obviously, you know, some of the different institutions that get picked apart. But there's a lot of desire to, for a return to international law. And of course, the United States has not been good at this. The United States should not have invaded Iraq. I'll just put it out there right now and many other things the US has done to violate international law. But the point still stands that most of the rest of the world you know, really, in fact, the majority of countries want to have the reestablishment of international law because that protects them from predation as well. Then there's the issue again of nuclear security, the Zaporizhia plant, you know, for example. And we have a UN intervention there with the International Atomic Energy Agency and Rafael Grossi. I mean, this is something that we, we could all support more. I mean, what a horror for everywhere if something happens to the Zaporizhia plant. It's not like Chernobyl, it's a more secure, safer uh, design. But we've had the Kakovka dam blown up, so you know it's had to be shut down. And it's also in the direct firing line of um, all of the battle over Zaporizhia. I mean, we need to have some international effort here. Again, this could push us in the UN towards some kind of you know, UN emergency action mm -hmm. to try to do something. Plus, um, I mentioned before, rogue acts and threats of uh, nuclear, using nuclear weapons. The Chinese don't like that. Nobody likes that. Because it then suggests that everyone should have a nuclear weapon. Because if we look back to 1994, when you had the Budapest Memorandum or Agreement for um, Ukraine, Ukraine was encouraged 
forced really to give up its nuclear weapons, uh, but with assurances of its um, you know, territorial integrity by the UK, the US and Russia. That was also acknowledged by the Chinese in 2013 and actually by everyone in the UN because it was basically ratified or been acknowledged by the United Nations. And basically the message from that is Ukraine was stupid to give up those nuclear weapons because what happened? It got invaded by Russia. So the message to all other countries, Japan, Korea, South Korea, that is, and others, is, well, you probably need a nuclear weapon because you've got a rogue state on your borders. The only way that you're going to have protection, and this is what the Finns are saying, is you know, to be part of a nuclear alliance or get your own nuclear weapon. We've got to change that. So again, that could be something in the United Nations. The Swedes, um, a few years ago, when I was in the government, were leading the charge to get rid of nuclear weapons. They wanted to have a UN ban on nuclear weapons. You might remember this. And they're kind of embarrassed now that they want to be in NATO. Because they're like, yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. we're now in a nuclear alliance. But yeah, things kind of changed a bit. But we'd still like to get rid of nuclear weapons. So perhaps the Swedes could pick that back up again <laughs> as a way you mm -hmm. know, of addressing mm -hmm. you know, this as well, that we want to have no more of these nuclear menace and these nuclear yeah. threats. And then the, you know, the other um, aspect is food security. When you talk to people who are in the agricultural business, agribusiness in the grain trade, between 10 and 20 million people could die this year because of the lack of access to Ukrainian grain. We just don't know what the Ukrainian planting has been, what the harvest will be, all the silos and the distribution networks have been um, destroyed. 40% of Ukrainian grain was produced by small scale farmers, not the large scale, and they've lost all of their shared equipment and the silos and the infrastructure. The Black Sea grain deal was put forward by the UN, but it's a bit of a band-aid. And of course, it's had a backlash in Europe because a lot of uh, Ukrainian grains got stuck. It wasn't intended for the European market, it's intended for export. Yeah. So we need to kind of figure out, can the European Union uh, you know, work together with the UN to make a bigger uh, effort here I mean, I think we need a kind of compact that we had with coal and steel at the end of World War II on grain and you know, food, food security fertilizer as well is an issue. Uh, that's where the, um, the Brazilians and other countries come in. They've been worried they've, they've lost their fertilizer access. And then you know, the rest of the world, obviously Africa, the African League going to uh, meet with Putin are really worried about um, food and food security. And if you think back to 2011, the Arab Spring was of course triggered off uh, by food riots over bread prices and we've already got starvation in so many other countries. We need to, you know, have some. This is something that Germany, you know, could really pick up on. Germany's always played a very, you know, active role on food and food security. The Norwegians, you know, all kinds of other countries. You know, we could have a, a task force that tries to work on the UN to push out, you know, food and uh, fertilizer. You know, the sort of food and um, you know the whole aspects of food security and whether we could you know, make this an international compact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'm I not saying it'll work, but I mean, we should at least try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this might be a nice time where we start our Q&A session. Yeah, that'd be great, right? yeah. Yeah, um, we have Nadia with a microphone. So if you have a question for Fiona, um, this is your time. Yeah, there's several. Mute. All right. Oh, okay. Now it's out. Yeah, we can uh, hear you fine. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Hill, Mrs. Hill, uh, you bring up a lot of brought up some interesting points about how China could play a role in the ending, uh, um, and uh, negotiating a fair ceasefire agreement between Russia and Ukraine. My, I hope to ask two questions. The first question would be, what if you know China actually gone through with the, you know, talking to both sides and securing a deal? What does it mean to the European and the United States? What would they see China as? What kind of character? in this, if that actually happened. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think given the situation that we're in, there would be absolutely no reason for anyone to reject um, a positive role by China or to reject any kind of settlement. If, you know, if we look back to um, more than 100 years ago, um, one of the very best um, 
peace deals was actually brokered by the United States in a very different context with Russo-Japanese war in 1905 by Teddy Roosevelt. It was actually, he got a Nobel Prize for it. And the United States at that point played a much more neutral role. That was before any of the US interventions in World War I and World War II. Mm. And, um, you know, it was a, it's kind of really very important example of what can kind of be done uh, in a... Uh, in a negotiation because there wasn't um, a definite outcome at the very beginning. Nobody knew how it would turn out, but both it was obvious that both Russia and Japan had reached something of an impasse. Now, of course, that had all kinds of knock-on effects afterwards, the Russo-Japanese war of, you know, all kinds of upheaval in um, Russia, and Russia actually had to concede territory of southern Sakhalin, um, the, uh, port, uh, the southern part of the Kuril Islands uh, to Japan, which Stalin took right back again, you know, at the end of... Um, uh, World War Two, but the whole process of it is very interesting because it was quite long, and all the people of Portsmouth were engaged in this as well. It was kind of a, a participatory, a larger participatory effort. Now, why am I talking about this? Because it's not that China is neutral, because I don't think China is neutral here. It's been very much on the side of of Russia for a whole variety of reasons, but China does have a bigger global role and has lots of relationships with all kinds of other countries, and actually does have the means to put some pressure. Um, on uh, Russia to move it towards the, ne the negotiating table, not by direct pressure, but by the withholding of support and by you know, changing uh, the narratives to some uh, degree as well. The complexity of this is, though, that I, I don't think that, as in the case of America back in 1905, uh, that China could do this all on its own because it isn't sufficiently neutral. And there's a, uh, also a precedent that's set for China, not just about Taiwan, but of also all kinds of other territorial disputes with India in the Himalayas, you know, for example, with Japan and the Senkakus, uh, but also for China itself, you know, at some point, you know, thinking about the fact that China's own territory was, you know, taken by, you know, Russia in the 1850s and the 1860s. Uh, you know, there were lots of disputes in and around China, but China also, um, over the longer term, this war is not in its interests. Uh, the, the use of nuclear weapons, you know, destabilization of um, international security, food security. China was heavily invested in Ukraine uh, before the war, including in agribusiness because of China's own worries about food security and, um, you know, its own um, agriculture and ability to uh, feed its population over the longer term. And also China in 2013 signed a whole series of agreements with Ukraine uh, recognizing Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and actually even saying to Ukraine that in the event that Ukraine was threatened with a nuclear weapon, it could call upon China uh, for consultations and assistance. Now, Ukraine hasn't actually you know, invoked that yet, but it could do in the United Nations, which in a way gives China a responsibility for doing something here. So there's all kinds of different complexities and dimensions about uh, China here, but China could see it's in its interest just as it helped broker in the final stages, um, uh, an agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia over Yemen, you know, it could see it in its interest to play something more of a peacekeeping role, but in a larger in a larger frame. It's kind of difficult. I don't know, you know, how one persuades China to think about this, but China does have also some responsibilities and some commitments that it made to Ukraine. And plus, when China, like uh, the United States and France and the um, United Kingdom, um, along with the Soviet Union, became the kind of guarantees of the UN system, also made an undertaking that, um, you know, against the use of uh, war and force for changing borders. And the whole premise of China's claims to Taiwan are about territorial integrity and sovereignty. You know, so basically letting Russia get away with what it's doing actually also turns some of China's own claims, you know, on its head. It's, it's pretty complex in you know, here, but, you know, if China, you know, could see it, um, or she or others, that maybe this is all going too far and there could be negative impacts. The other key thing, I think, is really what it's done, not just to, you know, China's relationship with Ukraine or, you know, other countries, but what it's done to China's relationships with Europe. Because China looks like a party to this conflict. Because of uh, the um, agreement with Putin, the bilateral agreement at the Beijing Olympics, just a couple of weeks before the war and talking about a limitless partnership. I mean, it almost looked, uh, and in fact it did look, as if China had facilitated the invasion, even though the Chinese government have said, you know, actually we had no idea that a special military operation meant something like this. They thought it was probably, you know, another uh, effort to uh, do something in Donbass, you know, for example. 
you know, so in a way, you know, China became complicit and has spent quite a lot of time, you know, trying to explain this in, in different ways, you know, afterwards. And it really has um, had an impact, as you're well aware. I mean, you're sitting here in Germany on, um, you know, and everybody here on the way that people think about China now. And um, if China, you know, seems to be not playing in a more even handed role in this over the longer term, you know, this will have uh, some effects. It's been extraordinarily bad, you know, for business, you know, writ large on top of, uh, you know, of, of the pandemic. And in any case, I mean, I, I think there is a case to be made and hopefully some people within China are making that case that China could play, you know, at least a facilitating role here, similar to, you know, roles that it has played before and also cementing its um, position as a, as a great power. You know, in the way that, you know, back in the 1900s, um, America did under uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. I think Zach and then there was another hand and then, yeah. Uh, hi, I wanted hi. to ask, since you're an expert on Russia, if you, how you would assess the current situation right now about Putin's power base, because we have seen in the last couple of days, but especially in the last couple of months that uh, he has high ranked people in his own lines uh, revolting against him. The, the, the Wagner group, when they marched to Moscow, there was no military intervention against them. Uh, it was rumored that the FSB knew about it and didn't really act upon it. And uh, also a very important part, I think, is that Prigozhin over the last couple of months has been openly uh, contradicting the Russian narrative about the war. And Putin just let that happen over the whole time. And even in this conflict now last weekend, uh, it was not Putin who was the one who solved it. Lukashenko came up as the man who handles the situation while Putin was furiously standing there uh, calling Prigozhin a traitor in public TV and then not punishing him in any way and letting yeah. him, letting it slip basically. Uh, so my question is pretty much if he is kind of losing the control because the Russian economy is declining the military seems stuck. He has his own people up against himself. And uh, also it is rumored that he has been very isolated for a pretty long time now and is not even getting all the correct informations about it. So could this lead to an ultimate collapse of his regime? Well, I mean, your last point there, I mean, that was, a, you know, we've laid it out in you know a lot of detail about him being isolated. I mean, that's that's really, really spot on and all those other things follow from that. Um, I mean, we all got isolated over COVID, but we didn't plan on invading neighbours. I mean, I, I don't know whether any of you kind of you know, decided to take over your neighbour's garden or something, you know, kind of during you know, all of this, the neighbour's balcony. I think we probably you know, kind of all had lots of uh, thoughts going on, you know, during this time. But, you know, I think COVID has a, um, a lot to say for why Putin made the mistakes that he did and a complete, you know, kind of um, false assessments of uh, the situation in Ukraine and, you know, more broadly. Um, it's you know, clear that he took advice from a very small group of people, um, including personal friends, people like Viktor Medvedchuk, um, a Ukrainian oligarch that he's close to, telling him that, you know, like people told, you know, the um, Bush administration with Iraq that, you know, you'll come in, people will, you know, greet you as liberators, they'll be throwing flowers at you, you know, exactly the contrary to, you know, what um, what actually happened there. So that isolation, that you know, lack of listening advice or people even getting access to him, I think, was a critical point. It seems to be in a critical element also in this bizarre you know, episode with Prigozhin that I think you, you know, describe quite accurately, although in the last day, and I haven't been able to catch up on this because I've been running from one thing to the next, there were some reports that um, Prigozhin was just cited, it, uh, uh, seen in St. Petersburg and Moscow, getting access to his bank accounts and that, you know, all of the, mm. you know, the things about him have been dropped. So, I mean, what this really was, it's almost like, you know, um, I mentioned this earlier today, like ripped out of the pages of history, you know, where mercenaries or generals go rogue and they get into fights with others and march on Rome kind of thing. We, you know, we, it's replete with these kinds of um, stories of warring princes. So Prigozhin was in a fight with the other generals. Um, and, you know, we all thought that the Wagner group was off the books. Putin has now told us, no, they were on the books that they were actually funded by directly by the um, Russian government. It's fascinating. Not only has Prigozhin told the truth about uh, the war, no threat from Ukraine, no threat from NATO. Um, now we know the truth that journalists have been trying to tell us for ages and with people like Catherine Belton in the UK getting sued 
by um, and, and others, and Elliot Higgins from Bellingcat getting sued by Pogosian, you know, basically that Wagner was a, a fully paid for entity of um, the Russian military, just off on the books, you know, kind of dark ledges, you know, paid off by the Kremlin. Putin said that, hey, you know, this was our group. So there's a fight among his generals. And it got out of hand. And that's where it gets into, you know, what you're saying here about, you know, what does that tell us about Putin? It tells us he got isolated. He let a, a fight among his generals about who should be the top dog in pursuing the war get out of hand to the point that now one of them has revealed all the things that everybody was saying all along. And now the kind of question is, you know, one minute, as you're saying, he's a traitor. The next minute he's there, you know, getting access to his bank accounts again. And he still seems to be walking around. You have the bizarreness of the president of uh, of uh, Belarus, which has now been fully absorbed by, uh, by Russia, uh, being the peacemaker here. It's not exactly what people think of as Alexander Lukashenko's um, you know, strong point. You know, so this is a this is a very bizarre episode, and it shows that this is a system that has a lot of problems. Now, it looks like, you know, Putin is going to go for the repression. I mean, I, I, mean, I always think back to Beslan in 2004. I was in Russia at the time watching this happen when the school was taken by the Chechen rebels. And there was a lot of rumours at that time, which some of them, you know, seem to have been the case, that this was a put-up, um, a, a kind of sting operation by the uh, Russian military intelligence to discredit the Chechens. You know, have them take a school, then they'd sweep in, you know, rescue all the kids and their families. Well, it was an absolute and utter disaster to the point that um, the head of uh, the, um, um, you know, the Russian uh, defence ministry at the time, Sergei Ivanov, told my, the group that I was with in Russia at the time that this was not his operation. And we thought that was very odd that he would spend so much time telling us that this was not the Ministry of Defence operation. You know, it's, you know, the rescue of um, hostages in a school, but it was because it was so botched and there was clearly... And they also lied about it. He, he, he tried to say that it was American special forces were involved, that they'd you know, found the body of an American soldier. It was not true. Remember, you might also remember that somebody's passport was stolen from an American um, teacher who was on his way to um, China or Hong Kong or somewhere. And th this was planted you know, in Georgia and, um, during the Georgian uh, you know, war. There, there's all these kinds of things that constantly, you know, these things are made up about what is actually happening. And... Um, you know, I was struck at the time by how chaotic and crazy this was, and it was set up for one um, circumstance. And immediately afterwards, Putin used Beslan and the debacle of Beslan to clamp down on the Russian political system. He got rid of elected mayors and elected governors. It had nothing to do with what had happened, but he used it as an opportunity to um, repress and to uh, assert his authority. So I think we're going to have to watch very closely here what happens. More repression. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot already going on. And then more of a strong action taken against Ukraine, because what Prigozhin was basically saying is these guys are incompetent. The war was a mistake, but we mustn't lose it. And, you know, I'm the only person who knows how to win this war. So it doesn't bode well, but it does show exactly as you say, in isolation, poor judgment, uh, terrible management of um, a situation and that the system's got a lot of problems. But just like with the Soviet Union, you know, back in 1989, you know, it looked like it was fine until it wasn't. So I can't say you know, when this will all fall apart, but we shouldn't be surprised if and when it does. And it could be tomorrow, but it could be a while from now. We just have to prepare ourselves. Yeah. The gentleman in the second row. Yeah, he was yeah. very... So um, no, um, thank you very much for coming to tubing. <laughs> I also got stuck 20 years ago. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> Not stuck. I enjoy being here. It's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, uh, I, I want to keep my question a little bit short. But um, at the end, um, I can say that, uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, before, one of the first things you said was that Putin is a rational but rogue actor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that always asks, that always forces me to ask myself, is he able to lose can he lose oh, this yeah yeah um but can he afford to lose it so the two questions are number one how does he perceive that is he ready to escalate to the point of you know what will it take for him to lose it and then i think the other area is the um are the other central asian nations and the other nations that let's say take their orders from moscow how are they viewing that and you know are they um, actually, do, do they have a horse in the race, number one? 
are they looking for an opportunity to expand their independence from Moscow? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, what you said before is, um, can he lose it? Of course. Can he afford to lose it? Of course not. <laughs> and, that, and that really is the that really is the crux of the problem. Then we get to all of these questions, which is, again gets back to China and other countries, mm -hmm. you know, watching this and, you know, basically, I mean, do we do any of us want to have, you know, a rogue uh, nuclear uh, state on our hands? We've got already got North Korea, but I mean, this is uh, dimensions much worse. And uh, so it's not just about tactical or intermediate nuclear weapons. It's also Zaporizhia. The callous, you know, disregard for, you know, the lives of uh, Russian servicemen who were, you know, sent through Chernobyl, you know, in the exclusion zone. The the, the way that they treated uh, the the staff at Chernobyl, you know, completely and utterly uh, disregarding, you know, the consequences of that, you know, accident. Putin is kind of, you know, willing to push things to all kinds of extremes. Now, the other thing on this is, of course, remember, Ukrainians were part of the Soviet Union and also part of the Russian Empire. It's not like they don't know any of all of this. And Ukrainians um, and the Soviet period, I mean, people you know, here in Germany are always talking about Russia, Russia, Russia from the Soviet period and World War II. Well, most of the fighting took place in Ukraine and Belarus. Yeah. It was Ukrainian partisans and others as well. And uh, uh, huge numbers of people who died were Ukrainians and Belarusians and Armenians and Moldovans and Kazakhs and Georgians and others. Ukrainians were very prominent in the Soviet army. They were also formerly you know, very quite prominent in the KGB. They know what they're dealing with here, uh, but they want to be their own people. I mean, just like the Americans, you know, there were many uh, English people who were formerly English people, you know, fighting for American independence. I mean, pretty much they were all Brits at one point, you know, so this is kind of these things are all possible. So they can't afford to lose either because this is about their people do not want to live under Russian occupation because Putin is showing, you know, plenty of um, signals about what that's going to be like. So, you know, we ask all the questions about Putin, but what about Ukrainians? I mean, I, I keep thinking, you know, uh, if we look back to the division of Germany, you know, what happened when Germany was divided? Millions of people fled East Germany and there had to be a wall built. Uh, I'm, I'm living in Berlin right by the patrol road of the wall, thinking about that 24-7. Every time I look out, I think about that. The ball was built to keep people in. You know, we've got the largest refugee crisis in Europe happening right now. The land that the Russian uh, military is occupying, and quite loosely remember as well, because we don't have that many people there, but in you know, real cruelty and all the key points, had 8 million people living in there before. I mean, that's you know kind of roughly about the size of um, East Germany. And it won't be you know kind of East Germany, because that was a, a separate country. This will be occupied by Russians who uh, want to turn Ukrainians into Russians. Um, even if they you know, speak Russian, they've just admitted 700,000 Ukrainian children you know, taken, or they've boasted that 700,000 Ukrainian children have, have, have been taken and taken off to, to Russia. I mean, we're in all kinds of dimensions that was hard to envisage you know, some time before. So Putin can escalate, but Ukraine can escalate as well. And it's not just a question of our you know, weapons and our support. Because you know Ukrainians um, uh, under World War II, there was partisan you know fighting. There was all you know kinds of things going on there as well. So it's not just a one-sided affair here. And anybody who's listened to Zelensky or anybody who's been kind of watching Ukraine, um, people do not want to live under Vladimir Putin in the in the Ukrainian perspective. In Belarus, it's complicated as well. I mean, lots of Belarusians who are here in um, Germany as well. The largest Belarusian diaspora is here, um, as well as in um, Poland. And, you know, they're not too happy, but the country's been just disappeared. Um, apart from Lukashenko popping up now and again, uh, Belarus seems to have vanished. And so when you get to the other states, it depends on who you are and what the relationship is uh, with Kazakhs. So when Prigozhin was marching on Moscow, um, Putin dialed a friend and he dialed two. He dialed Lukashenko, who he'd bailed out in 2020 when, you know, he'd botched his election and he dialed uh, Tokayev in Kazakhstan, who we'd just bailed out in the same period after he got into a fight with the former, you know, kind of president. Tokayev said, no, thanks, that's a <laughs> domestic issue of uh, Russia. <laughs> it didn't do a thing. Well, Lukashenko, and he's admitted it later because Lukashenko is always giving interviews and also like Prigozhin, you know, I'm busy saying things that, you know, people probably wish he wouldn't say. Lukashenko says, well, I had to do something because that would have been the end of us, meaning him and Putin, because Putin's propping up Lukashenko. Uh, and so 
if Prigozhin had got to Moscow, Lukashenko wouldn't have looked so great either. Chakayev, however, has moved away. Thank you very much. Thank you for intervening, but I really don't want anything to do with this. And you're seeing that, you know, from, you know, other uh, countries as well. But if you're Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan in particular, you've got some real mixed feelings when you asked about Central Asian states, because Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, their economies are highly dependent on Russia. So between 30 and 40 percent of their uh, GDP comes from remittances from Kyrgyz and Tajiks working in Russia. And you are really worried that Russia is falling apart. You don't want your Kyrgyz and Tajik citizens to be sent to the front in Ukraine, and some have been. I mean, they've been got dual citizenship on the Tajik side or just been swept up and sent off you know, to the, the battlefield in Ukraine. But you really also don't want Russia to fall apart. So you're kind of basically you know, like this the whole time, tearing your hair out and thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen mm -hmm. here? Because that's going to have all kinds of uh, all kinds of knock on effects. So it, it's it's a real mess. But again, that ought to be giving incentives uh, for um, you know countries to push and reach out. I mean, the Central Asian states have uh, you know relationships with China. You've got Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think they have been sending signals towards China, saying, "Can we do something here? You know, how do we how do we get this to end?" Because none of them, you know, had any um, animosity towards Ukraine. I mean, this is a horror because the Kazakhs are thinking, God, that could be us. You know, they kind of might invade us next because we sit on loads of territory that was, you know, formerly part of Russia and that the Russians have, you know, Russian nationalists have laid claim to before, the whole of northern part of Kazakhstan. And of course, Moldova, um, uh, there's a lot of fears there, very evidently that they're next in line. In fact, Lukashenko kind of warned them that they were on a television thing. He pointed to Moldova and next, you know, in line. So, I mean, everyone's um, really worried by about the implications of this, and they're trying to distance themselves or figure out what they can do in, in different kind of ways. Oh, good question. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. So I guess I have two questions. Um, on the one part, why Ukraine specifically? Why did Russia choose to invade Ukraine? Why not, like you had mentioned before, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, or Kyrgyzstan, or other former Soviet states that are arguably a little bit further to the east and so not consequently as important to the European Union and to European safety? And additionally, I guess this question is a lot broader. How do you see it playing out long term, uh, especially between the Chinese and Russian relationships? Um, since, you know, as you mentioned beforehand, given the situation of previous territories in Russia belonging to China, um, there are potential conflicts where maybe even Russia could change to being on better terms with the United States instead. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, why Ukraine? Um, there's multiple um, different reasons there. Um, in nationalist circles in Russia, um, so I've been working on these issues for a very long time. And when I was a graduate student at Harvard um, in the um, uh, 19, uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, I was a, um, a graduate student fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And you know, working with a lot of um, scholars um, on um, Ukrainian history and other things as well, because I was always very interested in Russian imperial history, and you know how these kind of dynamics were playing out over time. And Ukraine is obviously pretty fascinating. I mean, the name Ukraine means borderland. It's Russian's borderlands, of course, and it's you know kind of like many places in the rest of Europe. I mean, I come from a borderland. I told you the Romans, the Danes, you know, the Normans come up, and, you know. <laughs> beat us to pulp. <laughs> you know, sometimes we were under prince bishops. You know, I'm always fascinated by how empires, you know, kind of basically leave their mark and, you know, what happens to all these, you know, regions that are not fully incorporated in the centre. And Ukraine is pretty fascinating. Um, and, and, you know, kind of it's a melting pot as well of, you know, uh, Turkic and, you know, Slavic, uh, but also um, Balts and you've had the Swedes and, um, you know, all kinds of the Poles, all kinds of people moving in around those territories formerly part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know, for example. But for people like Putin, he comes out of this kind of nationalist cohort. In the um, early 1990s, there was this idea that, um, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, remember, the Soviet Union didn't actually collapse. It was written away by Boris Yeltsin, together with the uh, presidents of Belarus and Ukraine. I mean, they basically wrote away the Soviet Union. Mm. 
so it was kind of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine that decided that Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. And um, you know, 1991 in a hunting lodge in Belarus. So it was a kind of an elite coup against uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. But many Russian nationalists, they wanted rid of Gorbachev, but they wanted you know, to keep control of, of Russia, uh, Russia wanted to keep control of Belarus and Ukraine, and they created the Commonwealth of Independent States. And so it was an idea that they were kind of keeping them close. And then, you know, for just like many um, situations, you think about Czechoslovakia, for example, were independent, uh, you know, together, and then the Czechs and Slovaks decide to split the Velvet Divorce. Ukrainians and Belarusians also decided that they kind of wanted to move away. In fact, they kind of liked being you know, independent, and you know, there was always these complex, very different identities. And there was a lot of Russian nationalists who were still trying to, you know, keep them um, in place. And I wrote a report in. Um, 1993, uh, when I was a graduate student uh, researcher called Back in the USSR, it's still online, you can go back and, and read that <laughs> report, working with a whole bunch of Russians and others and Ukrainians, looking at the pressure that was being put on um, Ukraine uh, then to kind of keep it under check, manipulating nuclear weapons, uh, suggesting the Ukrainians were going to blow up the nuclear weapons, uh, suggesting that you know Ukrainians, Ukraine was going to go rogue. There was assassinations of Crimean Tatars. There was all kinds of things that were happening. This is the run-up to the Budapest Memorandum. And there was kind of already a feeling there that Ukraine was going its own way. And there were efforts even to pit um, Western Ukraine against Eastern Ukraine and talks of a civil war in Ukraine. And the research project I was working on was on an ethnic conflict in the former Soviet Union. We were looking at this very closely. So this is all before NATO or anything like this comes on the scene. And a lot of these Russian nationalists are now around Putin the same people. I've interviewed all of them, Alexander Dugin, I, all these reports that I did, I interviewed all these people. And they always felt that Ukraine was the critical borderland, that without Ukraine, you know, Russia was no longer the great state. It was its borderland and the window to Europe. And I mean, it's the kind of way that, you know, uh, Milosevic thought about uh, Kosovo, you know, in, uh, in the case of Serbia. It's, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, in Britain, it's very familiar in the way that, you know, the sort of expansion, you know, of all territory. All empires have a, a, a region that they think is particularly special and pertinent to them. It was how Russia became an empire. The Battle of Poltava, just like you've got the Battle of Kosovo Polia, you know, it kind of gets mythologized. I mean, in, in, in England, it's Agincourt, <laughs> a battle in France that gives you, you know, Shakespeare plays and uh, rude gestures and, uh, you know, but you, you, everyone's always talking about Agincourt. You've got even a, you know, national day where you're citing Shakespeare. You know, we could, ev everywhere's got these, you know, kind of crazy myths about, you know, history and the decisive uh, battle. Scotland's got all kinds of, you know, William Wallace and, you know, all the rest of it anyway. So uh, for many of these Russian nationalists, Ukraine becomes the kind of the, the sort of cradle of their mythologizing about Russia. And in the 1990s, Yeltsin, um, and I, this, I wrote my dissertation about this, set up um, a group of academics to try to think about the idea of a new Russian idea. He worried that, you know, Russia didn't have a kind of a locus point. And, you know, it's kind of they, they were kind of going back into history, you know, kind of trying to, you know, investigate what made Russia Russia. And at the end of um, uh, this kind of period in the late 1990s, they gave up on it because they couldn't come up with a kind of an idea. But there was a, a lot of uh, writing being um, uh, put out at that time about the importance of Ukraine and the borderlands and going back into Russian imperial history. And it's what Putin picks up when he comes into office in 2000 and the people around him. A lot of these people who were in that, those task forces um, start working uh, with Putin. And then, you know, you fast forward to 2011, when Putin comes back um, as um, uh, president again after having previously handed over to Dmitry Medvedev, and there's all these protests about Putin. They don't want him back, you know, on Bolotnaya Square and in St. Petersburg, you know, people were not that thrilled about Putin coming back. And so Putin starts picking up this new narrative or old narrative of, you know, the new Russian, the old Russian idea, you know, Russia and Ukraine being fused together. He starts writing all of these essays. So U Ukraine is part of this sort of myth mythologizing of a Russian state, you know, at a time of stress and, a, 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 and, and Putin's trying to legitimize himself with the stories of the past. His name, Vladimir, he's Vladimir Vladimirovich, his patronymic is also Vladimir. He starts extolling, you know, the virtues of Grand Prince Vladimir, was formerly Grand Prince Vladimir of Kiev, you know, takes on Christianity, but he suddenly becomes Holy Vladimir, uh, the person who Christianized Rus. You know, and he's kind of talking about, you know, these kind of this forging of the, 
the sort of the nation state, the Russian state. So Putin goes down a rabbit hole that many authoritarian leaders and many czars and, you know, many, um, you know, we can think about all these examples worldwide. You know, it's happened here in Germany. Various different points in here is uh, Putin, in, in, in many respects, trying to sort of create a new mythology uh, for Russia and for his presidency and trying to cloak himself in the garb of uh, the Russian czars. And I've been in many meetings with Putin in these, this big formal room, the one with the big white table that he sits here and everybody else sits down there. At that time, I think they put in extra portions of the table because it was much smaller <laughs> than I remember. <laughs> and, it's, and, and that room had some pretty critical statues. Uh, one is of Peter the Great, and that was over his left shoulder when he's sitting. In front of him, on the left, is Catherine the Great, and he had Alexander the Great's old greats. And then, um, anyway, I mean, but, uh, the, 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 but the point is that um, he sees himself as the sort of embodiment of the Tsars. And, you know, what about Cap Peter the Great? He has the bottle of Poltava on Ukrainian territory. And there was all these rumors that uh, Putin wanted to sort of celebrate you know, the Battle of Poltava um, when he invaded Ukraine. And, you know, kind of go there and sort of proclaim the end of this war in Poltava, for example, because Peter the Great for him is an obsession. And Catherine the Great, of course, is the, uh, the Tsar the Tsarina, who seizes Crimea, um, moves the whole way down the Sea of Azov and all the way down to Odessa, also into Bessarabia, Moldova, uh, creating new Russia, Nova Russia. And in one of the meetings, it's pretty memorable, you know, he's got Peter the Great over his left shoulder, and it, they're basically talking to us about Ukraine. You know, what's Ukraine to you? And when he says that, he looks at Catherine the Great. And I thought, oh, good God, you know, here we are. But we're, 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 we're lost in history. Yeah. And so why Ukraine? It's because it's kind of this fever dream of Putin about the Russian Empire, about his own legacy, about himself as him as the Tsar. It's not all to do with the expansion of NATO or all these other things. It started long before. It starts in the early 1990s when the people who are now surrounding Putin become really worried and obsessed about Russia losing its place. Remember, Putin talks about the greatest tragedy, the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it's also the Russian state. He's always going on about Lenin and the Bolsheviks and their destruction, the stab in the back of 1917. He talks about that with Prigozhin. And, it's, and, and he blames Lenin for creating Ukraine. He always says that Ukraine never existed until Vladimir Lenin you know, basically created it. Interestingly, when I was in um, the, Russia, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, my professor at the time, Roman Shpolog, uh, was writing a book. He never finished it. There's all these problems of academics writing these huge <laughs> books. And he also <laughs> came to the conclusion that Vladimir Lenin had helped create modern Ukraine. <laughs> and he's a Ukrainian because uh, Vladimir Lenin you know, did, in fact, you know, create the Ukrainian socialist uh, republic. I don't think he would have ever thought he would be agreeing with Vladimir Putin, uh, but you know it was kind of, and also Putin wasn't on the horizon then. But it was kind of interesting that even some Ukrainian historians had is, seen this, but as a positive role, which of course Putin is seeing it as a as a very negative role. So it's got a long history, and that then gets to the um, the question you had about China, in which I'd already, you know, from the earlier question said that China's got a long history too, a much longer history than Russia, <laughs> many millennia. And China has a long memory about its own territory. And over the longer term, I think Putin's creating problems for himself. I've only ever had one you know, really serious visit to China, so it does not make me an expert. But I went to the various historical institutes, and I was struck by the fact that on the map that I was looking at of um, China, um, a lot of territory was colored in, in, in the red color, <laughs> that was way north of the Amur, east of Lake Baikal and you know, now Vladivostok. And one of my colleagues was telling me recently that there's been a move in China to now use the Chinese names for Vladivostok and, you know, the other Habarovsk and some of the other, you know, settlements that the, uh, the Soviets established on the basis of, you know, former, you know, Chinese settlements. So I think that might kind of tell you that some tensions are probably likely down the line because Russia was maybe not from the point of view of, um, of Africa and other, you know, countries of colonial power, but for China... Russia was a European colonial power that also took its territory. Okay. I know I've probably provoked all kinds of other questions. You did. I? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm being provocative Should we have here. two to three more questions? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm game. You're good. Yeah. Okay. I've Great. had dinner. I don't okay. Have here we go. <laughs> <laughs> other people are sitting thinking, oh, I feel hungry, but I've had my dinner. So the white elephant in the room is the United States. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've been wondering, we were talking about China, yeah. China yeah. Finland. Ukraine, Russia, and yeah. here we are, the United States. Biden, 
is in power right now is people seem pretty rational. Congress is less rational. And uh, so I don't know where to start. Um, and you personally, I'm noting, are moving to England I'm after not decades. To England, first oh, I'm okay. I'm spending more so, time in England. Okay, <laughs> so your your chance are you doing like what we call in German Dimido, like Dienstag, Mittwoch, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday yeah, in well, England? Well, every few weeks. But well, it's, okay. just, it's a hedging strategy. Okay, so interesting. <laughs> so 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 talk more about that, like both politically, yeah. strategically, from the German perspective, um, what's going to happen in the United States in what like a year and a half? Uh, how we're looking? How 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 are you feeling about that? How what's going on? Well, look, I'm feeling extremely worried. Uh, I'll be I'll be frank, and everybody should be worried um, about what's happening. I think the United States is in one of the most difficult periods of its history. I mean, it's had many, uh, but this is um, a particularly dangerous moment. American democracy is under threat, and we have extreme partisan polarization. I actually don't think that American society is as polarized as people think, and is even I myself think, because when I travel around America, which I actually do a lot, um, I, I, I find that there's more commonality, but it's the partisan nature of the polarization which is really dangerous. Because the Democratic uh, Party is like the current coalition you have in Germany. So Biden's not that much different from Schultz with all of the difficulties that that has of managing a coalition. But this would be the coalition if you had the linker as well as the free Democrats, um, you know, kind of so in a really wide range. The Republican Party has been hijacked and completely taken over by a charismatic personality cult and a movement with um, all kinds of elements of fascism um, emerging in that, too. So I've been reading, you know, and rereading my 1930s German and 1920s history. Uh, there are a lot of things that we should be really concerned about, including the fact that um, people who are, you know, genuine Republicans, people I've worked with in um, uh, the Bush administration, you know, previously, many who've been working into the Trump administration to try to make it a normal administration, which is, you know, not at all what it was, um, have um, not stood up, you know, for their party, just like Hindenburg, Patton, you know, von Bitten, Holberg and others didn't do that here either, because all it does is take people not to stand up for what's right, as we know from here, I'm living in Berlin, two blocks away from the Zionskirche, where Dietrich um, Bernhofer mm -hmm. uh, was basically confirmed into the church. And I go back there every day and I read the plaque and it gives me chills. I'm doing it now. I can feel little goosebumps because thinking that, you know, he stood up or think about Niebuhr, you know, kind of first they came for the communists. I didn't stand up because I wasn't a communist, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Then they came for me and there was no one there to stand up for me. I mean, there is a, an incredible lack of political courage. Uh, on the part of members of Congress and also part of the Senate. And in that impeachment trial that I took part in, I remember thinking to the, co the congressional guys, what are you doing? This is not a game. And I tried to say that because they were throwing away congressional oversight for somebody who was not a Republican. Uh, he's not a conservative. Uh, he's a, a malignant narcissist. It's got nothing to do with politics. Trump is all about himself. And they were thinking that he was their route to power. I mean, how many times have we seen that in history? Again, getting back to Pogosian and other kinds of things as well. Whenever people hitch their wagon to you know, someone, they find that it's not what they thought. Vladimir Putin is exactly the same. Because Putin was put forward by Berezovsky and all these other people, many of whom are dead now. And they thought that they could control him, and they couldn't. Putin thought he could control Pogosian. It kind of seems to have got a little bit out of hand there. You know, uh, people are looking towards their own power, their own influence, and, you know, they're basically, um, you know, supporting someone that they absolutely shouldn't instead of looking at uh, democracy. And this is a really dangerous moment that we're in. So, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm particularly worried. I mean, we, we have a, an archaic 18th century um, electoral uh, system with the uh, Electoral College that obviously should be changed, although you still need to balance off state rights, you know, as you do mm -hmm. in Germany as well. Mm -hmm. We have a very robust uh, federal system, but we've now got states going in opposite directions. We've got soft secession. Mm -hmm. You don't have the same rights in mm -hmm. states. I mean, the lender here are you know, uh, very influential, and you've got different uh, systems. I was talking to the deputy mayor about you know, the way mayors are elected in different places. You know, you've got degrees of difference. You've got the lender have authorities over different things, but you've got basically the same rights. You do not have that in America anymore. When I went to America in 1989, I never expected this would happen. Uh, I, I couldn't conceive of this being the, uh, the direction of travel. But I also, in 1989, couldn't have conceived of this and what would happen in Russia either, mm. right? 
I mean, I started off uh, work, um, I, people say, oh, you, you're a Russia hawk. No, no, I love Russia. I, I love the culture. I mean, why have I spent my entire adult life studying Russia and Russian? Um, you know, I wanted to see the relationship, you know, change in a positive way. I certainly didn't want nuclear war. That's, you know, exactly why I set out. And I love the culture. I love people. I have loads of friends there. I do not like this system. And, you know, this group of people, they're also populists and fascists who are running it. And I, and I didn't expect, you know, when Putin first came in, there was lots of things to worry about, that he would have taken us all the way around on that path. I don't think it was inevitable, but it became, you know, so over time, that's where, you know, the United States is. So I think, you know, as friends of the United States, if you've got a chance to talk to members of Congress and mayors and delegations, you should tell them how worried you are about them. I mean, if, if this was, this was you know, kind of happening in any other country, you'd be saying something. So as you said, you know, B Biden is one thing, you know, he, but he's, a, he's a, a, a coalition president. He's quite, you know, like many presidents, he's quite weak. Trump was quite weak in many respects in terms of the power that he thought he had, but he undermined all of the institutions to strengthen himself. And he's laid the way for others. In the Soviet system, there was all the, you know, did Lenin pave the way for Stalin? Yep. Uh, you know, did Yeltsin pave the way for Putin? Yep. Because, you know, Yeltsin bombed his own White House, the, the parliament, you know, for example, in a battle over the constitution, making it, you know, crossing that threshold of violence in 1993. I was there then too and saw that happen. Absolutely disturbing. And we didn't push back against that. Put, uh, you know, kind of Putin's done, you know, all kinds of terrible things. Trump incited a mob to storm the Capitol. I mean, this is a man who tried to perpetrate a coup. I mean, there is no way that he should be reelected. It's um, highly probable that he's the candidate for the Republican Party. It's not probable that he's going to get elected, but it's also possible. And there's something really wrong with the American system that that's the case. And you know, people like Mitch McConnell, they know that, but they're not being brave enough to stand up and do something. They're kind of hoping that the voters, which is a pretty cowardly, you know, kind of position, are going to take care of it for them. But if you're manipulating mm -hmm. the electoral system, you know, imagine if the, elec if the elections in Thuringia, Saxony and Brandenburg here in 2024, you know, basically determine the elections for all of Germany and what, you know, the outcome would be. That's kind of what we're looking at. Because um, the 77 to 80,000 votes uh, for Trump in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania determined the fate of the whole country. And that's exactly what the, you know, the Electoral College, yeah. you know, it'd be like if you went back to the electors <laughs> of, you know, Brandenburg and Trier and Mainz and everything back into German history and the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. I mean, it's a mess, basically. And I mean, I think we have to, well, that's why I'm speaking out. And, you know, I'm not running for office. I'm not, I don't want anyone's money. But I want to um, see you know, American uh, democracy saved because it's um, that's a country, you know, that's given me an awful lot. I chose to you know go there in 1989 and to stay there, and you know we've got a chance to turn this around. But only if people stand up and say and do something. And it's not about partisan politics; it's about the future of America and its democracy. And people need to speak out about that. And I just wish you know more of the people that I'd served in previous governments would would, would do that. And it's not yeah. to say people didn't try, because people did try. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, not good. <laughs> but it could be. Well, if, if people step up. There is a thank you. There's a question in the front there. Right away. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you for everything we were uh, could hear to this evening. There's one question in Germany: the support, our support for Ukraine, is fading away slowly. And there's one train of thought which you already addressed, which is that NATO encroached on Russia and uh, <clears throat> all the other things. But the other one is many people start to negate that Ukraine really has agency in all of that. They say that Europe Maidan was a, a coup caged by the United States, a string puppet of a president funded by uh, oligarchs, uh, <clears throat> there has something has happened there, and what can you say about this agency this, this these people really have, and why does it make sense that we support them? Well, uh, look, I think you can see that Ukrainians have agency individually. Um, you know, they fought back uh, against Putin, so Putin bought that same propaganda and that same conspiracy theory himself. So, I mean, uh, that was actually one of the elements when when you know asked before about why Ukraine, because Putin thought the Ukraine wasn't real. 
Ukraine, he thought that Ukraine was fully paid for by the CIA. Uh, he thought that, you know, kind of, there was always a plot. He always thinks that, by the way. Uh, and he doesn't believe that anybody has agency. Germans, French, you know, Brits, Americans, we're all, you know, kind of controlled by oligarchs or the CIA. I mean, if only, you know, kind of the CIA or something, you know, I'm sure they think it would be that powerful. But, you know, the, the America is not that powerful. The CIA is not that powerful. People have free will and they also, you know, have a, a collective um, sense of, of agency. And that's what we saw in the case of Ukraine. And so Putin made a huge mistake by believing that too. So Germans would be making a mistake in thinking exactly the same thing. So it's true that Zelensky was not popular. That was another mistake that... Um, that Putin made. He didn't know that Zelensky was going to turn into the next Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill wasn't popular, by the way, in the UK either and was kicked out <laughs> after the war. But just like Zelensky, he was a bit of an actor. And he was, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a guy who knew how to turn a phrase. He knew how to, he was a great public relations expert. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of Zelensky has risen to the occasion. It's true, his, his uh, ratings were tanking. It is also true that oligarchs had a huge influence. Um, they won't have very much influence, you know, moving forward either. But oligarchs have enormous influence in Russia. Oligarchs have lots of influence in other settings as well, including the United States. And what's Elon Musk? He's a bloody oligarch, you know. And what does he have right now? Twitter. We should be very worried and very afraid of oligarchal influence and all kinds of. It's not the military-industrial complex. It's people like Elon Musk we should be worried about. And those are exactly the characters that we had in uh, Ukraine, and you know, we have in Russia as well. It's oligarchs who told Putin that Ukraine is all a joke. Viktor Medvedchuk, he was wrong. You know, so Putin goes in thinking exactly this and he gets the fight of his life because the Ukrainians were gonna fight. Because Ukrainians always fought. Yeah. The Cossacks fought back, you know, in, in, back in the day. Um, you know, the people fled to Ukraine because they didn't want to be under central authority. There's always been this really rebellious frontier streak, you know, there. And I mean, yes, we went in there to support them, but Ukrainians are basically, um, exerting their own agency and their own free will because they do not want to be told who they are and how to live. And I, you know, spoke to so many Ukrainians now who are just incensed that people would actually think, you know, all of these kind of things about them. The people who are dying on the, on the fronts in Bakhmut are not dying, you know, for Renat Akhmetov or for you know, Poroshenko or even for Zelensky. I mean, they're, they're basically, they're there fighting for themselves as many, you know, kind of other people around the world have always done in those kinds of circumstances. That's their country. That's their place. And we'd all do the same, right, if it was, uh, if, it, if it happened to us as well. So I, and, I, and I think, you know, in general terms, what I've been saying as well before, everyone in Europe has to realize that this is really about European security. What Putin wants to do is drag us back to the past. So do we want to have the Turks and the Greeks fight about Aegean Islands? I had a very serious, uh, senior Turkish official say to me, well, you know, if um, Ukraine's borders move east, we've got claims on Aegean Islands. Why shouldn't we make claims on those? I mean, that's, you know, kind of, again, in Europe, I don't know where your holiday home is, you know, in kind of Greece, but, you know, good luck with that, you know, kind of in the future. I know a lot of Germans have holiday homes in Greece or used to, you know, it might not be yours anymore. It might be, you know, in the middle of a, of a war Mallorca. zone. Well, mm -hmm. you know, who claims Mallorca? Let's then <laughs> start to think, you know, well, go, don't go to Gibraltar. You know, you have the Spanish mm -hmm. and the, you know, the, the, the Brits facing off, for example. I mean, the, the problem is that they're dragging us back to a past that we wanted to leave behind. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, you know, again, the message to say to Putin, we don't want to go back to those bitter pasts. We wanted to move forward. And Ukrainians, you know, that Euromaidan, you know, how many times have you seen a revolt with a European flag, you know, kind of being waved? You know, that was sincere. That mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, it, the, the U.S. had much less to do with what happened on Euromaidan than, you know, people think. I mean, yeah, there was the U.S. politicians and others, you know, trying to make something of it. The U.S. always likes to gain, take credit for things that it hasn't really had a role in. This was all about Ukraine and Ukrainians. And it will continue to be, even if we decide not to support them, you know, they're going to continue to fight of partisans. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, who would want to live under occupation in a, in a massive, you know, kind of war zone in Zaporizhia and Kherson? You know, people have drowned and all the kind of things that have happened. I mean, we've got to think that these are real people. This is not just talking about territory. We're talking about people. I mean, do you want to live like that? I know I don't. And I, and I know that Ukrainians don't, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we have... One <laughs> There's a strange gurgling noise that keeps there, happening. There is. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, I don't yeah. know where it comes from. Um, There's so many more questions. But maybe two more questions 
the gentleman over there and then Gabriela Abbott in the front. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is it working? Yes, uh, yeah, it is, yeah. Um, uh, so my question is regarding, I believe it was in March, the, with the ICE, uh, the ICJ decision, the International Court of Justice uh, issuing two arrest warrants for both for Putin and one of his high, uh, high ranking ministers for this uh, with the affair with the 700,000 Ukrainian children. So my question is how, what kind of role do you foresee th these sort of things and this sort of in, sort of international pariah status, as I've heard it being called, being afforded to Putin and his high ministers through this? And do you think that the International Court of Justice can even affect that? And kind of along with that, too, I mean, the United States isn't even a member of the International Court of Justice. Yeah, it's the International Criminal Court. Or International yeah, Criminal yeah, Court, excuse yeah. me. But yeah. either way, how will the, this kind of relationship with the, with the U.S. is sort of a, a, accepting the authority of the court in this case, but not really a part of it, how does that sort of impact this sort of this interplay here? Well, this goes back to the United Nations, what I said before, that there are also a lot of other countries, you know, that really feel very strongly about UN institutions and the rule of law. I mean, just because the United States hasn't um, signed on to the International Criminal Court doesn't mean that the International Criminal Court doesn't have, you know, some due restrictions of its own and other countries can support that. So let's just put that out first of all. And the other thing, it's a very narrow um, focus case about children. And in fact, I mean, the, the, the Russians have just said themselves this 700,000 figure. That's way in excess of you know what the uh, was brought forward for the case. I mean, we, we were talking at that point. I think it was at twenty three thousand or thirty thousand, but a much you know smaller mm. smaller number of you know documented cases. And now we have senior Russian officials saying they've actually taken seven hundred thousand children. Yeah, over a longer period of time, exactly going back into the Don uh, Bass uh, time as well. So we were looking at a kind of a snapshot of the war. So, I mean, absolutely right. So we're actually now talking of something of much larger dimensions. And that absolutely falls into the kind of the categories of uh, the jurisdiction of the United Nations and the International Criminal Court to stop that kind of thing. You know, that already happened under periods of genocide and, you know, during World War Two. The Soviet Union, of course, deported, you know, millions of, uh, uh, of people from you know, the, uh, the Crimean Tatars, you know, the Chechens, you know, others into Central Asia, you know, during World War II. Uh, we've, of course, you know, with all the deportations of the Holocaust and everything that happened here as well, we've always said that we weren't going to allow that to happen again. So I think taking the U.S. out of this, because we always keep bringing the U.S. into it, and just looking at it as a standalone case for Ukraine, there's a solid case there. But I do think, which is kind of probably what you're leading up to, there shouldn't just be selective application of this. I mean, if, if, you know, there are other cases, I mean, I think about what's happening, you know, in Europe at, at borders in the United States as well, of the separation of children from their families. It's happening in the UK. Mm -hmm. You know, they've lost 700 children in the UK that have been taken away from their families. I mean, where the heck did they go? You know, and, and the same thing has been happening in the United States when at the border children were separated. There may be other applications for this. So we, we shouldn't be just thinking about this in selective terms. But absolutely, something should be done about... Um, this case and there is evidence you know obviously that's been uh, collected there and also in war crimes and ukraine should be made to suffer because of the sins or the emissions of the united states or any other country ukraine should be looked at standalone it gets back you know to what you said before we tend to look through this all this lens yes i know i've been a u.s official but we're always looking this through the lens of well what did the united states do well this is about ukraine this is about europe this is about european schools about children it shouldn't have anything to do with what the United States has done or not done. Uh, but if there is a case that should be brought and that has precedent for other things, that should be you know, brought forward as well. And we shouldn't be you know, shying away from that. The problem is, of course, as you're also saying, we get a lot of politicization um, of all of these um, you know, international bodies. But that's what we should be striving towards is to make them you know, once more more neutral and you know, bring other countries or I mean, the countries like uh, Ghana and Kenya and others, you know, who are taking these kind of things, you know, very seriously. Uh, we should try to get them, you know, to sort of step into these roles again as well. Thank you. And there's one more question over here. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks, Fiona, for your uh, great analysis. And uh, we certainly live in very scary and remarkable times. Site and vendor tries to capture some of that and. In, in the first couple of weeks, we were all thinking the Ukrainians don't won't have a chance anyway. So why waste military goods on them? That kind of. So this has changed. But wh where do you see then, or where would you like to see more support, also in military terms? And where would you draw a red line 
uh, from the perspective of NATO? Look, I think we, we shouldn't just think about this in military terms. I mean, I, I keep talking about we need a diplomatic surge. So we need to be, you know, going out there, you know, substantively engaging with countries from China and India and Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore and Kenya and uh, everybody. We need to be getting everybody on board here uh, to try to address this conflict, but also promising more substantively that we will start to be equally circumspect uh, and um, serious about other conflicts. I mean, we hear an awful lot of times about, well, you didn't do anything, you're not doing anything in Sudan. What about Yemen? You know, we haven't been exactly living up to, you know, kind of the promises that we've made as you know, the West and the international community since World War II. We've, we've watched all kinds of horrors happen. And we tend to automatically go towards a military solution. And, you know, you'll, you'll hear from many, you know, military officials, including, you know, Stoltenberg has just been, you know, um, uh, I guess extended again. He also speaks very strongly about the importance of diplomacy. I mean, he's a former, you know, politician. So we need to have these things hand in hand. You know, not everything will uh, always have a military solution. We just tend always to kind of think about that each term. So it's not so much about drawing lines, it's about you know understanding that we have to approach this from multiple different angles. And there's been a lot of kind of sitting back, waiting to try to see what the Ukrainians can pull out of all of this offensive. And, it, and again, not everything is always decided on the battlefield. And, and we have to, again, you know, get back to uh, a major diplomatic effort to try to move things forward. So I mean, that's kind of something here that um, I'm, uh, I'm really urging. But we also have to start with the premise of international law, the recognition of Ukraine as a sovereign independent state that has been recognized by everybody in the UN uh, context. And, and, and you know, a lot of this you know, probably has to happen at the UN, having hearings again you know, about all of these recognitions of the Ukraine, because if Ukraine is allowed to you know, collapse and be absorbed by Russia, it won't end there. It will not end there. And so, again, it's also not just about NATO. I mean, as I said that before, the Finns have decided they want to be in NATO, but it's really about all the other countries. It's not just about whether the United States will support Ukraine. The Baltic states have thrown everything at Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The Finns, 280,000 people that they can bring under arms. The Finns are serious. And then this is the Finns we're talking about. Nice <laughs> Finns, happy Finns, you know, kind of <laughs> best country in the world Finns. Mm -hmm. They're saying this is really serious. We need to step up. We need to help Ukraine. I was in a meeting um, before uh, the, the war, it was the week before, when it was obvious that, maybe perhaps not here, but in France, but obvious that, um, and the Finns knew that the Russians were going to invade. And the Finnish ambassador said to the um, Ukrainian ambassador, you're going to have to fight. You're just going to have to keep on fighting because that's what we had to do. And don't, you know, kind of just don't give up because it's the only way you're going to survive. And the Ukrainian ambassador took a big gulp and looked, you know, very unhappy. But the, mm -hmm. this is the Finns telling telling her that she had to, they were going to have to fight. And I mean, that's sometimes you absolutely have to, whether you want to or, you, you know, kind of uh, that's, you know, not something that you'd be thinking about and you don't want to think about that. But, you know, that's kind of basically what the, the predicament the Ukrainians are. So it's not just about NATO, it's all about us. Uh, and it's them with the Poles, uh, the, the, the Bolts, the, the Finns, uh, the Swedes, the Norwegians want to step up, the Danes, the Dutch. Uh, lots of other countries are now rethinking their neutrality as a result of all of this. The Irish in the Ice, uh, you know, Iceland, for example. The Irish got menaced by the Russian Navy. Remember, they had to send their trawlers out because they don't have a Navy. And, and, uh, and, the, and the, <laughs> the um, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov accused the, um, uh, the Irish of being aggressive because they sent out a bunch of fishermen, you know, to kind <laughs> of like, you know, head off the, the Russian Navy. So you've got a lot of um, other countries here mm. are saying this has really changed a lot of things here. And whether we like it or not, you know, we wanted to be neutral. We wanted to actually demilitarize. We're now being put in a predicament where we've got to figure out a way of pushing back. But again, it's not just a solution of NATO. It's not just a solution of armaments. It's not a solution of just, you know, sending planes or this or that. It's about how we posture ourselves writ large politically, economically, and in terms of thinking about security in a holistic fashion and also about diplomacy. And look, we've got some great diplomats out there. We can definitely do something, uh, something more. We also have the benefit, as I said, of many other countries really wanting to see a reassertion of international law. And everybody shouldn't be just waiting to see whether Trump's going to get um, re-elected in 2024. It's what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. And Putin's waiting. You know, he's kind of, you know, waiting around to see. He just believes we won't get our act together. Can we not just prove him wrong? The Ukrainians proved him wrong. You know, we could do that too. I mean, he just assumes that we're just going to give it all up. 
and that we're just going to abandon Ukraine. And the, and the Ukrainians have that sneaking suspicion that we're going to as well. They're convinced that there's some hidden negotiation going on, you know, just to sort of sell them down the river. And when we talk to Ukrainians, they're always asking, you know, what's going on here? Henry Kissinger, actually, in a, in a meeting that um, I'm laughing a little bit because it was kind of the way that he said it, it was quite interesting. He said, I'm always asked, I can't do his doing his job down here very deeply, <laughs> saying that Ukrainians think that I'm negotiating something. I'm 100 years old. What do you th they think I'm doing? <laughs> you know, the, the idea that they were, you know, he was rushing around, you know, trying to, you know, negotiate all of this. But his point was also that we needed more diplomacy and a, and a, and a more um, serious effort here. Thank you. Look, I'm certain that you have so many more questions, but I think this is the moment where we thank Fiona Hill for her generosity, really, um, for sharing all your expertise and analysis um, and personal stories and experience. So thank you. No, thank, thank you, you so time. much. Thank yeah. It also got quite hot in here, and I think a lot of people haven't had dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need food and drink, right? Um, ich möchte noch ganz kurz eine Sache sichtbar machen. Und zwar, das sind die Köpfe und die Hände, die dieses Event möglich gemacht haben. Und das ist einmal die Nadja da hinten, die haben Sie gesehen mit dem Mikrofon. Das ist unsere Praktikantin. Dann gibt es den Sergen in der Mitte, der hat auch geholfen. Das ist auch unser Praktikant. Ja. Charlotte an der Technik. Ja. Und dann unsere Kulturreferentin Sophia. Danke. Ja. Vielen Dank, dass Sie hier waren. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause, haben Sie einen schönen Abend und kommen Sie wieder. Danke. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you. That was so much fun. Yeah.